When Jesus died for sin, as far as the Father is concerned, we died with him. That's what justification is all about. When Jesus rose from the dead, he guaranteed our future bodily resurrection because we are in union with him. Where he goes, we go. We are, to quote that passage a second time, partakers of the divine nature. We are in Christ, spiritually related. I want to turn our attention to this second part of the message now. We're going to look at verse 3. And I've entitled this uh, second heading, Baptism, the means of our union with Christ. Okay, you might remember that in the last message from Romans, I preempted this, and I suppose some of you have been wondering what I'm going to say about this. Let's read verse 3 aloud together. We go to the appropriate book first. Looking at verse 3 of chapter 6 of the book of Romans. Ready? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Now this and the verses following are often read at baptisms, and rightly so, because we understand perhaps from this passage more about baptism than any other passage within the New Testament. It teaches us a beautiful symbolism that's involved in baptism. But let me say this, baptism is not the main point of discussion here at all. It is our union with Christ that takes center stage in this particular passage. And there is a danger that we might miss that altogether because our focus is so often when we read this passage on baptism. I want us to consider the following expressions, though, which would indicate very strongly that it, the main thrust of the passage is on our union with Christ. Verse 3, we are baptized into Christ. Verse 4, we are buried with him into ba uh, by baptism into death. Verse 5, we are planted together in his likeness, in the, rather the likeness of his death. Verse 8, Paul speaks of our being dead with Christ and our living with him. So clearly the whole of this particular passage here is dealing with our union with Christ. That is what is in the forefront of the apostles thinking, even though along the way he's going to touch on lots of other issues, everything's going to come back to that. We have to be careful when we interpret scripture that we get an idea of the main thrust of what that scripture is saying, even though it may say many other things which are perhaps interesting to people. If we don't know exactly what the main thrust is, then we can misinterpret the passage. Now, having just established that baptism is not the main point here, it seems a little ironic now to have to spend some time looking at baptism in detail. You see, the fact is that there are some things that are difficult to understand about baptism as it occurs here. Verses 3 and 4 clearly speak to us of being baptised into Christ's death. I want us to look at that again. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. Okay, that much is clear. We have been baptized into his death. But the purpose of that is given in the second half of verse 4. That, or so that, or for this purpose, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, 
even so we also should walk in newness of life. That's the purpose for our union with Christ's death. And this is clearly teaching that being baptized into Christ's death confers a spiritual power upon us to walk in newness of life. That is the very purpose of our being crucified with Christ. So that, ultimately, ba -da -ba -da -ba -da, we might walk in newness of life. That's the purpose. Now this creates a dilemma for us, really, as far as we un our understanding here is concerned, because it means that water baptism has some kind of magical power, just like the Catholics believe. And as good Baptists, we don't want to believe that kind of thing, do we? And to make our dilemma even more acute, we've already seen that the whole context here is focused on our union with Christ. So it's definitely speaking about a reality, something happening here. And it would appear from verse 3 that baptism is the means of that union. Because it speaks of us having been baptized into Jesus Christ. And in fact, as we shall see, that is exactly what Paul is meaning to say. He has said what he has said because he means what he says. But the big question is this. What does the apostle mean when he speaks of being baptized here? If we say that the passage speaks of water baptism then we end up teaching the heresy of baptismal regeneration. That's exactly what Constantine believed. Constantine went out in the 4th century, he baptized all of his army, made them into instant Christians, or so he thought. It didn't matter that they raped and pillaged and burned villages, they were Christians because they were baptized. Constantine believed that when he baptized his soldiers in the water, he was baptizing them into Jesus Christ, and that is exactly the wording the apostle uses here. Why would he not think that? But is Paul teaching, really, that water baptism has the power to save him? No, this is the question, and for this reason, most Baptists have understood that the Apostle is speaking of spirit baptism here. I want you to turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Verses 12 and 13. For as the body is one and hath many members and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. And he's speaking here about the body of Christ. Is every individual who is in union with Christ, that is who is saved, I'm speaking about the universal church here. Look at verse 13. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. Okay. It is the Spirit baptism. Now, this is not anything that takes place as the Pentecostals think when you have their hands laid upon you when you come up out of the water and gabble in tongues, it's not what it's talking about. It's speaking about the salvation experience when we, are, when we come into union with Christ, when we are made part of the universal church, the universal body. We can use that expression, universal church. Universal is probably not uh, an acceptable term in some circles. But I know that if in the book of Ephesians it talks about the fact 
that the body is the church very plainly in one particular passage. And whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we are bond or free, and have been made to drink into the one spirit, it's all believers who are genuinely saved, born again by the Spirit of God, the expression is used here that they are baptized by the Spirit into the body of Christ. Okay, well let us go back to our passage in Romans chapter 6. And we see now that this is what's happening at the point of salvation. And that is why we can speak of being, or well, the apostle can speak here in Romans 6 and verse 3, of being baptized into Jesus Christ. Speaking about our conversion. Okay, well we've settled that. But if we take the passage to be speaking of spirit baptism that takes place at the point of conversion, and I think we ought to, we need to ask the question honestly, does that mean that we have been leading people up the garden path by teaching the symbolism of water baptism from this passage? I got you thinking. You thinking? I hope your college students are thinking. All Baptist preachers that I know of use this passage to teach the symbolism of baptism to baptismal candidates. I do. And the fact is that most who believe in full immersion baptism would see the outward symbolism of water baptism explained in this passage. On the other hand, people like the Presbyterian brethren who believe in sprinkling instead of a full immersion baptism, those who would defend that position of sprinkling, those who would totally deny that there's any pictorial illustration of the death and the burial and the resurrection intended in water baptism here, they argue that since this passage must be speaking about spirit baptism, they realise that the same as we Baptists do. Now, they don't want to go into baptismal regeneration any more than you or I do. And we are agreed on that point. They say, well, since that is the case, then it is a mistake to see any allusion to water baptism whatsoever here. They've got their bases covered. They're not worried. And by teaching this, <clears throat> they effectively undercut the correct biblical position, which really sees a beautiful picture of the believer's union with Christ's death and resurrection. And it's illustrated here by immersion in water and re-immersion from the water. That's what the Bible teaches. Some of those who sprinkle will even admit that full immersion baptism was the thing that the early church practiced. That's very hard to disprove. And yet they say it's reading too much into the text to say that actually going under the water symbolises our death with Christ and that rising up out of the water symbolises our resurrection with Christ. So people, if we concede to that view, we take one step towards a theological justification for sprinkling. Understand? my position and we deny also a beautiful object lesson which is intended here in the New Testament for baptism Now, what I've just tried to do is to point out to you that either way we go with this thing we're faced with a theological dilemma if we say it refers to spirit baptism like most Protestants do then it would seem to undercut our own ground as Baptists who believe in immersion on the other hand, if we argue solidly for water baptism, we concede ground to those who teach the heresy of baptismal 